Okay, so you're planning a trip to sacred Nepal. So you're going to be stopping by temples and you talk about how it's steeped in the culture of the yoga tr tradition. And from our last conversation, I remember that uh, your first exploration of spiritual India came at age 22. Uh, yeah. What exactly is a spiritual pilgrimage and what is the point of what is the point of this? It's a good point. Um, you know, in the busyness of life, you know, there's a saying that um, repetition is the mother of mastery. So in the um, busyness of life and the minutia that we get caught up in life, it's good to have some time of our day that we have focused on our spiritual life. I got work to do. We got kids or we've got, you know, uh, activities to do. But we should take some part of our day for a spiritual meditation or spiritual focus, spiritual study it's yoga, whatever you need for whatever spiritual path you're on. So that in one sense is like a pilgrimage for your day. You've taken that time. It's sacred. You block it out. No one disturbs you. Um, and in the week, we should have that as well. We should block out some time of our week is a little bit, you know, more connected. Um, and also in the course of a year, um, it's also nice to take maybe a weekend off or a week off or two weeks off, something like that. And what that does is it just keeps us on our spiritual trajectory. You could probably use the same example for anything you're studying. You know, you could do it for music. You got to practice every day or for art. You got to um, draw every day or for writing. You should write every day and maybe go away for a bigger. So in spiritual life, it's the same thing. It's a time to go away. And pilgrimage is a time to fully immerse yourself. Um, so generally, uh, that was what people did in India. That was the uh, there was no Epicot or Bush Gardens or Disneyland. You went with your family, and you'd walk to these holy places. And sometimes you, it's like a life's journey, you know, because it's hard to believe this, but before automobiles, people walked places and people did it and they would go. And sometimes they wouldn't come back for years or sometimes they'd never come back or sometimes they'd die. Um, but this is what pilgrimage was. You go to these holy places where you can really focus, let go of the busyness of your life and get dive into some type of depth of your spiritual life. Um, so we like to, I want to say recreate it, but just it's just what we do. We have we have time, and and by the way, there's also in the same way if you're on a, a music retreat where you're just studying music every day, and then you go away and you do some in depth study of violin or piano. There's certain parameters you would follow, perhaps, or writing, etc. So there's certain parameters on a pilgrimage that you do that stuff you don't normally do when you're, you know, at home, you don't watch Netflix while you're on pilgrimage, you know, you don't, uh, you know, you don't go to the bar while you're in pilgrimage, something like that. And some people like to keep that as part of their life. They just have these parameters in their life, but on pilgrimage, you show up on your a game and you get a lot out of it because of it. In the same way, if you go to a jujitsu seminar or a martial arts seminar, you get a lot more out of it because you can really focus on it. Does that make sense? So India is a classic place for pilgrimage. And Nepal, which we're going to this year, is um, not only breathtaking because it's in the Himalayas, but Nepal was an old Indian kingdom. So there's a lot of ancient temples, sacred rivers, holy places in that area as well. But um, now it just happens to be a different country as all of Southeast Asia has been broken up. Pakistan, Afghanistan, that was all parts of the Vedic culture, even Burma. Indonesia, you, you'll find traces of Vedic culture all over there. Yeah, I think it's definitely important. Uh, I've been thinking about that recently, about how each day should have some work and then some relaxation and then some, uh, I feel like it's the thought that maybe Monday through Friday or your current work schedule is uh, the hell part of your of your life. And then weekend is the relaxation part. And I think I've been talking about it recently a lot that you should be building in these things to your daily life. There should be a time of the day where you can just uh, stop and focus on uh, maybe your like your spiritual path um, or focus on, you know, the things that truly do bring you peace of mind, whether that be music or martial arts or painting or whatever that is. 
there should be a point of every day that shouldn't be like and it's cool how it's like daily weekly and then you do, do like a yearly do you think there's a thing because you're going to places like india nepal do you think that those places the physical location of them have something about them that uh like increase the increase the pilgrimage the effects of it they, uh, the sacred literature at least in india says it does now whether you believe that or not that's another thing but because collectively people do believe that it's filled with sacred people that's another thing right like if we, you and i are just going to go down a times square there's a, there's sort of like a a rough idea of the mood that's going to be at times square on midnight on friday night it's just you get a sort of idea if i say yeah we're going to go to church in uh the deep south a baptist church in you know south carolina on a sunday morning we're going to get an idea of what's going to be there so there's an idea in india that people go to holy places to perform holy activities with a certain mindset and that's what you and if i find in this world you sort of get what you look for for example i don't take drugs i haven't taken drugs but there's probably a place to get drugs like heroin or cocaine probably right around me i don't know about it because i don't look for them but when you're tuned into things you tend to find them so someone could say oh i know if you're a heroin addict you probably know exactly where to get heroin <laughs> like maybe within a three mile radius from where i live i just it's a it's not on my radar so to speak. So when you go to these spiritual places, generally, it's not like everybody's going to be pure or saintly, but generally it attracts those type of people that go to these places. And at least I can speak for India. These places are ancient. Even the old books of India speak about these places having existed for millennia previous. So a lot of the places I'll take people on pilgrimage Krishna or Krishna's brother Balaram went to those same places on pilgrimage or modern day saints like Yogananda, Swami Prabhupada, um, you know, they went to these places anyway. You know what I mean? But when you, you even hear of like the avatars have gone to these places like uh, in Rishikesh, that's where, um, you know, Ram bathed in the river Ganga. So how, how old is Ram? It, like Ram's millennia old like he's from a previous age he's not even from you know re the recorded age his it it, it it it's almost incalculable so there's holy places all over india that are like that that the the descendants they say are still from these areas yeah i you guess know, places like really, pushkar you know yeah i guess it doesn't even really matter whether or not it uh, actually does increase spirituality because if the collective reality uh, believes it does sure and all these people gather there for that reason, then then it does. Then it know? does. It just becomes that. Exactly. W whether exactly. some of them, yeah, whether it's a sort of ha half of it's a myth, a third of it's a myth, 90% of it's a myth, whatever it is, we've created it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's created. It's in, it's in the, uh, it's, it's in the collective thought. You're right. Do, do you think that there's a, there is a, like a real objective reality as opposed to just collectively, uh, shared beliefs that uh, have become our our reality well there's definitely subjective realities like you and i might have a reality and then if a, you know depending well humans depending on what their goals are in existence is that you know they have different realities like some people's reality is that this world is a miserable place some people's reality is this world is a great place so much opportunity um and then there's so everybody has their own subjective reality. And then, of course, a sheep has a reality and a duck has a reality and a tree has a reality. There's a reality according to a tree. Trees can sense some type of danger. It's been you know, studied. Sheep I, I, or ducks can definitely sense some danger. They have some type of reality. And then you have the each unique being and their own mind. In the same way you and I have a different mind, two different sheep may have a different mind and a different reality. If, if, a, if an animal was tortured in its infancy, then it's going to grow up fearful. You know, if a dog was beaten, it's going to have a different reality. So subjective realities exist. And um, according to the Vedic thought of ancient India, there is an objective reality as well. And matter of fact, that's what is taught in those books is what is objective reality. 
And they say that the concept of science in the material world is imperfect because you can't, you know, the word science means to know. Um, and you can't fully know because of exactly what you said. We have a subjective reality. And therefore, what can I actually know? Like, for example, if I'm in this house and I never leave this room, what do I know of Costa Rica or Brazil? I'll never know. If there's no computer here or no television here, all I know from this world is this room or this prison cell. So I will never have objective reality if I'm sitting in, uh, if, because my senses are limited. So therefore, if my senses are limited, how can I have, how can I have perfect knowledge when there's imperfect senses? So even if I do know, even if I have traveled the entire world, I'm still seeing it from my vantage point, just like a sheep will see the world and a duck will see the world from their vantage point. Um, so there's so many different subjective realities. What is the objective reality? And the Vedas teach that. It, they, they say there is an objective reality and they teach it so you can, uh, and, and, and they invite you to opt into it to see if that objective reality works. And I can just shine a little light if you're interested in what that object, objective reality is. Would you like me to share? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. One objective reality is you're not a boy and I'm not a boy. There's no such thing as a black man, a white man, an Asian man. These are all subjective realities. And they say subjective realities are limited to time. They're, they're confined by a prison of time. So they say in objective reality, you're just a spiritual being. And for a moment in time, you have this male body and it's going to change. And that almost like, uh, you know, this stop, what, what's it called? Like those high, those cameras that go really fast high speed cameras they show like a, a plant blossoming and then the, the plant the, the flower blossoming and then the plant wilting it's this, it's just a camera of it speeded up so we could see your life from infancy growing up as a teenager 20 then you go to your 40s 50s 60s and then you see your body dwindling you could do that with your body now there is a conscious being witnessing your entire body change they say that conscious being that is actually reality and your conscious self got plucked not plucked but uh, implanted or impregnated into this world and it's been sort of like changing bodies in the same way we've been changing body in that uh, in that sped up camera that energy who is you is going to go into some other body some other womb some other egg some other seed and then it's going to be convinced out of the energy of illusion that oh i'm just like right now i'm thinking i'm an italian american new yorker that same consciousness will go into some other body and be convinced, no, I'm a, I'm a sheep, I'm a goat, I'm a dog, or I'm African or I'm American. There's a, there's a Netflix documentary that, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm totally into uh, reincarnation and the concept of that spirit is different than matter. But there's a Netflix uh, series that came out called Surviving Death. I don't know if you saw it. No, I, no, I haven't. Episode six is stellar. It's about children, and there's a very common phenomenon, children generally under the age of four who start talking about their previous existence, and it's uncanny. I mean, if you've never, if you're, I mean, I, I believe in reincarnation, but after I saw this, I was like, oh my God, yes. It's, it's almost like a little scary. Like, you know, you get like a four-year-old saying that, you know, my name's Philip, and I have a different mother. And my mother had beautiful hair and beautiful earrings. And we used to play at this park and I died. And this is how I died. And then uh, at least on one of the episodes, and there's many, many cases like this, but this is one that's just documented on Netflix. Um, it's, it, by the way, it's called Surviving Death. Episode six is about children. And um, it's this, the mother who's hearing this story. It's almost eerie. This little child is speaking above a previous life and a different mother. And then the mother Googles the, the, per, the child who he says his name was. And then she finds the death of this person. 
Yeah, it's, and it's quite like, and there's many, many cases like that. As a matter of fact, there's a whole branch of study at the University of Virginia that studies these anomalies. I say anomaly because if I was to say, yes, in my last life, I had a dream that I was, um, I was a king. I was a king of uh, Germany or something, of the German region. You could say, well, you know, Raghunath, he's, he's so nuts. He just makes this shit up. But if I was to say as a child, as a four-year-old or as a three-year-old that actually this is my name and this is where I lived and this is how I died and um, I, these are my siblings and you can do research and find that, that's a whole different story. Or another common one, and this is one of my students told me this, this was really crazy, that they have a, a child never exposed to media, never around any um, people that spoke Spanish. The child started spontaneously speaking another language. And then the child started to explain how she died at her wedding. It was such a, it was almost eerie. The lady called up in, in uh, um, the lady called up like in tears. So there are these anomalies that, that, that don't, you can't figure out. There's no way a three-year-old can speak Spanish if they've never been exposed to television or if they're homeschooled and all of a sudden spontaneous speaking. And I'm not just making this up. These are yeah. like recorded things mm -hmm. um, that, you know, there's departments that study this stuff. Well, in terms so it, of like, in terms of like reincarnation, uh, which is kind of like a little bit what we're talking about, uh, I read in some Vedic texts that uh, some people are born as karmis, which is you essentially work for the, like the material goods and you seek uh, like uh, these sensual pleasures. Some people are born as bhaktis. Some people are born as yogis and um, almost as if like you're born into this, uh, this destiny. Now, I was reading this book uh, and it was talking about how free will is making the argument for free will not existing because everything that we think um, and this book has nothing to do with Vedic tradition or yogis or anything like that. But the book basically says that everything that we think is uh, based upon our past, our past uh, thoughts. So essentially, I'm born into this family. My mother t t teaches me this one thing. And uh, I build upon that, build upon that, build upon that until the point where even if I do decide like, hey, I think I'd like to uh, listen to this band instead of this one, or maybe I'll like to uh, write this name instead of that one. Or maybe I want to do jujitsu instead of boxing or boxing instead of jujitsu. It's not really you choosing. It is an accumulation of everything that you sure. once went through affecting that choice. Uh, and I tie that into the whole uh, Vedic ideology of being born as a karmi, a yogi, a bhakti. What do you think about free will and whether or not it, it exists? That's a great question. And, and there's a lot of truth in what you said that we have very little free will because we are so programmed and we are, um, uh, we're programmed by our family um, and by our society and by culture and by media. Um, so to say like, I'm making a choice, it's really in one, in one sense, it's a lot of bullshit. Why did I wear these particular pants or this particular sweater? is because I see it in context of a culture that wears these pants and wear the, well, why aren't I wearing just like a, you know, a, a big red dress today? <laughs> you know, it, it's, a, it, it's flowing because men generally don't wear dresses. So I don't wear them, you know? So we, we opt into hairstyles and, uh, you know, do you like a neck that goes lower or a V neck or turtleneck? Do you like baggy pants or tight pants? The funny thing is we watch culture change styles regularly, regularly. So is it my choice? So the yogis where the, the Vedic culture says, actually your choices are very limited and there's a way to expand your choices. You, you, you use the word free will. So, the yoga system teaches how to expand your free will. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'll, I'll spare you some of the details, but there is this activities that are very, very dark or very, very negative or very, very um, binding. Let's say something like drug addiction. 
if you've taken drugs and they've ruined your life to the point where you've lost your family, you've lost your job, you've lost your home, you've lost your money, you've been incarcerated, and then all of a sudden you get out of jail for a few days and someone says, hey, you want some drugs? I'm selling some drugs really cheap. Generally, the drug addict will say, yes, I do. And if you try to reason with them, are you sure? You lost everything. Yes, yes, I want it. So when we act in this, it's called tamaguna. It means it's like a, it's like a consciousness that's very low. Um, and it's addictive. It's dark. It's lethargic. If you act in that consciousness, your free will is gone. You're almost like completely bound up by your body. That's what addiction is. You've lost all your free will. So that's why when you study these mystics of the yoga tradition, there is a control of what they speak about, of what they hear, of, uh, 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 of their sexual energy, of what they consume in their mouth. All that type of control is to take the senses back under control so the senses don't own them. For example, in January or in December, I did a fast for 21 days on water basically, and, and some juice. So in the first few days, you get a little agitated. You start thinking, oh man, what, what's there to eat? I even open the refrigerator and looking around, but I know that I'm not, I can't eat anything. I'm doing a fast. So in that fast, I, 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 I'm bothered because my senses are sort of owning me. I'm not even hungry, actually, sometimes when you're fasting. After a while, you don't even get hungry but you start looking around. So the senses have such a pull on us. Is it my desire? Is it my intelligence? Or is it just my senses? So as we start to control the senses, they, they start to loosen the grip of the leash they have on us. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then, sorry. And then within this body, I have more free will. Now, the problem with the yogis say is you still have some karma that you have to deal with from a previous life and in this life. I've done some things in this life that's going to affect my today, and I've done some things in a previous life that are going to affect my today. So karma is real. Addiction and these lower gunas or lower consciousness is real. But there's ways to – the entire yoga system is to regulate your senses and your mind to get, enhance your freedom and to make a different choice. When we make the same choices again and again, it almost appears like that figure eight. The yogis, the Hindus, the Buddhists, they call this samsara. It means like a wheel of birth and death. You're doing the same old shit again and again and again and again. Same lifetime after lifetime. You're doing the same thing. You're finding someone you're attracted to. You have to pop out a bunch of kids. You know, you work really hard. You save some money. Now, if you meet somebody, meet some book, meet some person, meet some YouTube video that starts to change the trajectory of your life, it can give you, and that's what yoga, that's what a real yoga system is. It gives you an access point out of the figure eight. And that's what spiritual life is. It means I'm going to act differently this time. I heard something and I'm going to use that free will I have to act differently. So you can look at what you spoke at as your destiny. It's a real thing. For example, if you and me are flying on a plane uh, to, go to, to go to Miami, that is like our karma. You can't really, for the most part, you can't get out of that plane. But how we behave on that plane, that's our free will. Does that make sense? There is some free will. It's limited. But you can get drunk on that plane or you can fall asleep on the plane, or you can read the Bible on the plane, or you can read uh, Goethe or Shakespeare on the plane, or you can watch uh, violent movies on the plane, or you could even hijack the plane. So there's a lot of opportunities on that plane, but they're still limited because you got this plane. So you and I, we got this male body in this lifetime. We don't even know when it's gonna end. We don't know when the body might be dismantled. But while we're here, and we don't know when we're going to get sick or healthy or have a stroke or have a heart attack or anything like that or get hit by a car. So we, there is some limitations with this vehicle on this journey to Miami, so to speak. But while we're here in this body, we have some opportunity. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. I, I agree with what you said, and that's a good way to look at it. Although there is, there is some sense of free will 
And it would make sense seeing as because we, we feel it. We, you feel the ability to like, especially once you embark on some sort of a journey of consciousness, you feel the ability to like set yourself apart. You, you, you feel the ability to um, really make a cut from these uh, things that might be poisoning you or weakening your, your mentality and just essentially making your life worse. But also sure. you are, you are bound by not only your past in this life, but anything that has come before then, even if you don't believe that uh, you were once alive before other people were alive before, obviously. And if you study history, you see that everything that has ever happened is affecting what is happening right now. So I right. think there's an external, there's an external, you know, for example, I have, I'm getting some karma of, you know, Abraham Lincoln yeah. and, and the culture that was set up in America. And if I was born in Indonesia, I'd have a different history would also affect my choices and my free will as well. Absolutely. And you, you talk a lot about uh, how a real uh, yogic path does this or how a real yoga teacher would do that. What do you mean by real yoga? Because there's people who are listening to this who are going to say, what are you talking about? Stretching? What do you mean real That's yoga? Good question. So yoga is taught in tradition and the stretching part of it, which we is pop. If I say yoga, if my, if my, you know, my doctor says you need to do more yoga, you know, generally there's talking about a stretching um, regimen, but truthfully um, that is more like a condiment of a much bigger meal. It's like salt. The yoga system is really a changing of the consciousness, a change of perception, a change of your choices, a change of how you treat people in this world. They have some of them have to do with like physical practice, but a lot of them are very internal workings. Um, and um, it's sort of like recalibrating the consciousness. When I speak of yoga, I speak in the most broadest picture. And how I know that is I, I, I've been taught in traditions and yoga comes down from a tradition and you have to be careful where your tradition comes from. Cause sometimes it just started a lot of like physical yoga practices came from some yoga person from India who came here maybe in 1970 and started teaching some stretching. And then some Americans, you know, sort of appropriated it. And they were like, you know, I was an ex dancer, a ballerina. And then I uh, got into yoga and now I teach yoga and they start teaching their spin on yoga without really understanding the culture or the philosophy. And that's what is actually cultural appropriation. They just throw their own spin on it and talk about, you know, well, I learned this in dance school and I learned how to do splits and I learned about the um, anatomy of a body in my, cause I was a physical therapist, but it's different. Yogic anatomy is different. It's all with the subtle body really. And, um, uh, it's much less to do with the physical body. The physical body, some, it, it, you know, it, there's practical things w with it as well. But a lot of the work in the yoga system for transformation is subtle. Matter of fact, the physical body is very one of the greatest yoga masters of all time, and the most one of the most popular ones, whose name was Krishna Namacharya. Um, and he was around, you know, at the turn, you know, in the early 1900s. Um, he, he said that physical yoga will change you significantly. He says, but breathing techniques will change you even double as much. And he said, sound mantras will change you even double that. So as our practice of yoga gets more subtle, what happens is the the transformation becomes magnified. That makes sense. Yeah, and the purpose is, I guess, to like you said, recalibrate your consciousness. Which brings me to my next question: Is what do you think human consciousness is? Um, because earlier we were talking about um, how about free will and about uh, the subjective and objective realities. And one of the things you said was that there is like consciousness is one of the realities that the Vedic the Vedic traditions teach, right? And, you know, there's arguments that uh, AI will be able to redo human consciousness because they claim that all it is is uh, electrons in the brain and neurons in the brain's firing. So if they can just prog that, program that into an algorithm, they claim that they can recreate it. They haven't done it yet, but they claim that's that called, they can. That's called a post-dated check. 
Mm-hmm. Imagine mm-hmm. if I said, yeah, I'm going to give you a million. Yeah, you come over my house to like a, you know, re-landscape my garden, you know, and you're, you, you give me the bill and it's like uh, 10,000 bucks. I say, okay, here's a check. You can cash it sometime in the future. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I want my money right now. Mm-hmm. People can talk about all these things, about mm-hmm. creating life and creating consciousness. It's a post data check. They're, they're talking about it, but they're not doing it. Yeah. To actually create the, to create spirit. What do you think? What do you think human cons- consciousness is? Do you think it is the epicenter of uh, intelligence and rational thought? Do you think that it is uh, what makes you decide what you're going to do if you're going to go through A course or B course? What do you think that it is? Um, first of all, is uh, what I think is very puny because I'm, first of all, I'm not so bright. Second of all, who gives a shit what I think? It's like what I think and what you think, what everybody thinks. It's just a bunch of, we're just guessing. Um, and because I am a, a yoga teacher, I'll teach you what the yogis think. And that's, that's my only position. That's my only qualification to even speak on your podcast is um, I'm just representing the culture of the yogis. Um, and I'm not really here to give my opinion unless you ask me my opinion, but I'll teach you what the yogis teach, that the consciousness is very life itself. And the intelligence and the mind work underneath the work. They're matter, but they're subtle matter. But the the self itself is a a spiritual being. In the same way we have a, uh, we say we have a body and we, or my my mom and Judeo-Christian culture would say you have a soul. The yogis say, no, no, you are a soul. That is you. And then you have a body. And you also have a subtle body. You have a mind. You have an intelligence. You have an ego. That's not, also, that, all, that's not you also. You have those things. And they're temporary and they're changeable. In the same way I can work out and change my biceps by you know curling uh, weights, I can also change my mind. I can change my intelligence and I can change my ego. And there is a pure self but the self gets covered. It's a. It's different than the concept in Christianity taught, where there is a. You're born sinful. The yogis have this concept of a pure soul theology, that we're actually pure. Um, in the same way, the sun is shining on me through the window right now. But to the degree that that window gets dirty, or if it's colored, if it's a stained glass, then I'll see the sun through a different filter. So they say that the, the pure spirit is pure. It's just covered by filters, stained glass. Sometimes I use the example of goggles. You know, you have goggles that can make everything, you know, you know, you know, bright. So in this world, we wear different goggles. Sometimes we wear a goggle of greed, right? If you're wearing the goggle of nature, like you love nature, and I wear the goggle of greed. So you might say, hey, Raghunath, look at that beautiful mountain. And I say, oh, yeah, we could we could cut down all those trees and build condominiums on those mountains. And I could sell those condominiums. I, I could probably buy that mountain for cheap and then sell it. So the goggles of greed make me see things through different vantage points. The goggles of lust. You know, um, you know, it, I once went on a pilgrimage once and uh, I came back and I was in a great mood. I said, yeah, I went on a great pilgrimage. I spoke to this guy that I knew. And he said, oh, really? You went on a pilgrimage? That sounds great. I heard there's a lot of hot girls that go on pilgrimage. And I was thinking, here I am talking about something sacred and transformational. And he's asking me if there's hot girls going. So he's hearing about pilgrimage, but his Google, his Google glasses, his goggles were based on lust. So sometimes we'll go into this world with different goggles. And the yogis say, you got to get rid. If you really want to have pure vision, if you really want to wipe the windows, you need to get rid of lust and greed and envy and anger and competition and illusion because they're, they're going to cover your it's not because you're evil or you're sinful or you're bad you're just crippling yourself if i say something sinful that makes it sound like i'm being judged you're not being judged you can do whatever you want you got a body do whatever you want with your body but what you are is you're crippling yourself let's just it's, it's like saying hey man check out my new ferrari watch what i'm going to do i'm just going to take a, a gun and shoot out one of the tires. You're like, why the hell did you do that? I don't know. I just wanted to try it. Uh, okay, do it. 
but now you're not gonna be able to go as fast. The ride, it's gonna damage the rim. It, it's not good for the car. So you can do whatever you want with your body. There's no judgment. The concept of Bhagavan or divine spirit or Krishna, Krishna doesn't care what you do with your body. Um, out of love, no one likes to see someone suffer, but uh, uh, out of love also, there's free will, <laughs> right? If I, if I have my wife in a headlock and put a gun to her head and say, you better start to love me, is that love? No, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it is coercion. So in, a, in, in the universe, all the spirit souls called the jivas have free will. But our free will, when you really love someone, you let them free and you let them choose. And that's why yoga, which actually means the reconnection of spirit and the divine, that's why it's actually so sweet because you're lovingly choosing to let go of the crippling choices of the material world. What do you think? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> there was a lot to take in. I was just really, really concentrating on what you were saying. Okay. Um, what came to my mind is. Um, so like. Your first spiritual exploration came roughly at 22 when you left, uh, you left a lot of your life behind and you and you went over to India um, and but you still do this, you still take spiritual journeys, you still take pilgrimages. What is the difference from then until now of what those things do for your life? Uh, what realizations did you come to then as opposed to now with all these journeys that you take? You know, um, there is, how old are you? I'm 25. 25. So, you know, we view our spiritual life or our life in general, everybody does, from different vantage points. When you're 17, everything's looking up, right? Like, well, what am I going to do when I'm 21? What am I going to do when I'm 25? You know, and there's opportunity. And you see the material world as very, very shiny and exciting and, and, and incredible place. Like, I would look up when I was younger, I'd look up to sports stars and think, wow, could I ever play football professionally? And um, I remember just watching the, I watched the Super Bowl this year, and I was thinking, these guys are a bunch of children. They're a bunch of children. And there was a time when I looked up, well, look at the police officer. Or the, look at this guy. He's like a general in the army. Now it's like I'm thinking a lot of like, uh, you know, I'm older than a lot of colonels. I'm older than, you know, it, it maybe a president or something or a senator. or So as or I, 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 I couldn't even join the army at my age right now. They wouldn't want me. Um, so at different vantage points of your life, you see the world as a place of opportunity, as a place of... Um, exploration as a place of romance and excitement and then you get to a different vantage point and you 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 that window closed you missed that window you're no longer going to be in the uh uh the nfl raganoff that's not an option for you you're no longer going to be a new york police department you're no longer going to be in uh, the united states marines they don't want you anymore you're not going to be a navy seal so i'm not saying you should be depressed or anything but my point is from different vantage points, life appears different. So from different vantage points, your spiritual life, your spiritual journeys will appear different. When I was younger, or take, for example, my children. My children study the teachings of Ram. How do they study the teachings? They read the stories. They read it in a comic book form. Ram gives some, met, some mantras and some, you learn in the form of archetypes of good and evil and good choices and bad choices and repercussions and um, this person that represents courage. Um, sometimes they'll even learn mantras in their childhood. I'll teach them mantras. Now, those mantras just sort of sound like a game almost. It, it, it seems like an almost like a nursery rhyme to a child. But as a child starts to go through puberty and experience life, those mantras start to unpack themselves. Those stories start to unpack themselves. That wisdom, which came in the form of a fantastic archetype and a, uh, of a hero and a villain it starts to unpack yourself and you start to see yourself in the evil and the uh, the hero and the villain oh wow now i'm acting like this particular archetype so everything becomes blossoms more as a child goes from you know eight years old to 15 years old and then it's going to look different when you're 22 years old 
It's going to look different when you're 35 years old and maybe you're starting to settle down. And then um, you know, when your kids are teenagers and grown up, it's a different vantage point. So yeah, for sure. Every time I go to India, um, to holy places, or whenever I study spiritual literature, it it's a different it's like seeing a flower at different forms. The seed is very beautiful. The, bud, uh, the, the stem is very beautiful. The bud is very beautiful. The blossom is very beautiful. The fragrance is very beautiful. It's just a different vantage point of something. Uh, and uh, it definitely affects me differently. Yeah, cause, because you, age and different uh, factors of your life and different times of your life, they are truly just different vantage points. I've never really thought of it that mm -hmm. way, seeing as I'm, as I'm, arguably in the first or second vantage point of my life and in my mind kind of like oh i thought that was when i was 15 but now from 25 on is this is how i'll think forever it looks i mean think about here's a nice way to put it if you were 15 what tattoo would you get yeah would it be a lot different than your tattoo now <laughs> and you know and then when, when you're 35 you're 25 now so when you're 35 would you be like what the hell was i thinking getting that tattoo because our minds change our intelligence change our desires change what do you need? What do you need as, as, as Ray to be happy? What do you think? Are, what do you need in your day to day life? Or what are you not worried about in terms of like a lot of people, including myself can go through these things of like, if I don't get uh, this test, uh, this score on this test, like everything's going to be ruined. My whole everything is ruined. I need right. this to be happy. But then I see people who are you get this idea. And I don't know if it's real or you get this idea of uh, these yogis and these, uh, uh, these Buddhas and these that are free from that shit that just that is like does not affect them. So I'm curious, what do you need to be happy? Well, I, I will say I'm not such a evolved soul, <laughs> but I will say that um, if you do this process right, you can be in solitary confinement in prison and be very joyful. Our happiness at least the way these spiritual practices are goading us or ushering us, they are making you find your joy internally as opposed to, I need everything to be perfect for me to be happy. And we know that's sort of, in our heart of hearts, we know that's sort of bull anyway. Like I, you can go on a beautiful vacation to uh, the Florida Keys or to Aruba and have a miserable time because our externals influence us to some degree, but it's really our internals that make up our quality of existence. So if I can get learn how to find a joy within, and this is why I became a monk, this is why other people become monks oftentimes, is, and this is why there's this concept even in the Bible that is sort of enigmatic and mysterious when I was younger. Like, why doesn't God want me to have fun? What kind of sadistic, horrible, you know, offensive, you know, trauma-inducing God is this? You can't do this. You can't do that. The idea, and and I I I feel like following a Vedic path, I got a better idea of this. The idea is that we're not trying to go out to find our pleasure. We're renouncing going out so we can find our pleasure from going within. And when you can find that pleasure going within, you need nothing. That's a very beautiful thing. That's a great place to be. And um, that's a practice. And you, after a while, you stop becoming tricked by, hey, man, come over here. It's going to be great over here. Hey, man, fly over there. It's going to be great over there. You stop letting those little tricks of the material energy fool you. Otherwise, you're on, you're just chasing carrots all over the place. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. That's, that's amazing. And I want to, once again, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and blessing us with knowledge. I get a lot out of this. I get a lot of, out of uh, hearing you speak and it, it makes me uh, try to apply these things to my personal life, which is what I hope uh, everyone tries to do. You know, um, you have uh, you've had a lot of experience and I, I like the fact that uh, you've not only just learned these things, but, um, try your best to apply them in day-to-day -day life from uh, a young age to now and throughout all the vantage points in your life. So thank you once again. It's great to see you doing this from a young age also. Um, if you're young, take spiritual life very seriously. It's something that ages well with you. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but if you feel like, well, I'm too old, I should have done this when I was, don't let that be an excuse. There's a, there's a saying in permaculture, the best time to plant a nut tree is seven years ago. Like if you're planting a walnut tree, because it takes some time to mature or, or best time to plant one is maybe 30 years ago, mm-hmm. because by the time they're mature, they give so many nuts. The second best to plant one is today. Mm. So if you feel like I've wasted my life, what have I done? I should have done this young. The, the second best time to start your spiritual life is right now. So it, 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 wherever you're at, take it seriously. And, you know, I've been trying to take it seriously, but I, I feel like I've fallen short in so many ways. So the best I can do with my life is, is, is to hear spiritual truth on a regular basis. So truthfully, I want to thank you because none of this stuff I'm teaching you or that we spoke about today is my stuff. Like I said earlier, I'm not that bright, but I feel like there's, I feel like truth is eternal and it's for everyone of all spiritual traditions. No one owns it. It's not owned by India or China or um, uh, uh, some other region, but truth is an eternal thing. And if we apply it to our life, it becomes wisdom. And this is sort of the practice. So I want to thank you because it brought out a lot of these important points that are good for me to hear as well. So mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you, man. Peace. Good work. Have a good day. Thanks, Later. brother. Let me know when this comes out, okay? For sure, for sure.